She was the pinup girl whose poster once graced so many teenagers' walls. She was one of Charlie's angels, with the cascading hair and that dazzling smile. And in recent years, Farrah Fawcett also became a symbol of the will to survive. But just this morning, the 62-year-old actress lost her valiant battle against cancer. Farrah Fawcett and I had been in touch for many years personally. Professionally, we'd done some wonderful interviews together. Last week, as she struggled to hold on, I went to Los Angeles to talk with some of the people closest to her, including her longtime lover, who was at her side when she died, actor Brian O'Neill. Tonight, we want to celebrate the life, the loves, the legacy of this very special woman. During her last days, as Farrah Fawcett clung to life, fighting to the end in her home and finally in the hospital, those who knew and loved her remembered. Magical. She had stardust on her. An original. No one looks like her, sounds like her. Sexy, beautiful, I mean, incredible. She's always been a style icon, obviously imitated by everybody around the world. I've always thought of her as fearless. Nothing seems to scare her. She's quite decisive, moves forward, and she doesn't look back and she doesn't regret. Courageous. An amazing woman with simple roots that took on challenges that others wouldn't try. I always admire women that are independent, that have a dream, and then look as good as she does. <laughs> Cancer took Farrah Fawcett's life, but not our enduring memory of her iconic beauty, grit, and courage. I don't want to just go through life skimming it and being another person on screen and not living. And what a life she lived. It was, most agree, a spirited journey, and tonight, one to be celebrated. The year was 1976, and this poster launched a million fantasies. She was the pinup with the brilliant smile, a mane of golden hair, and that bombshell body. It sold a staggering 12 million copies, the largest ever. Farrah Fawcett burst onto the scene as the it girl of the 1970s, a sex symbol idolized by men and women. Her hair, which became known as the Farrah Do, was copied by millions around the world. It was an easy, carefree haircut, windblown, but also very sexy and very feminine. Everybody wanted it. Jose Ibert, the legendary hairstylist, has known and worked with Farah for over 30 years. That signature hair would definitely be remembered forever and ever and ever. But I think that Farah was represented to me what a woman was in the 70s. Woman's lib, there was a freedom about Farah's look. There was something healthy about her. It was something different. Very much so. Back then, women were still wearing their hair quite a little too stiff. And all of a sudden, that freedom about Farah's hair was unbelievable. Early in her career, I interviewed Farah and asked how she saw herself. On a scale of 1 to 10, where would you put you? No kidding, real honest. I, I know, I can uh, an answer you quite honestly that I've never told the truth. Oh, tell the truth now. A 9. Yeah. Why, uh, you know, I would, <laughs> well, look around the world, my lord, you're, you're, in a, you're a 10, you're an 11. You're, no, no, well, barely a 9. I was going to say 8.5. But I thought fractions aren't good. <laughs> I think you have to have all of me uh, um, in order to think that I'm beautiful. In other words, it's not just my looks. I think I have to speak and move and relate for you to feel beauty from me. And then four years later, this exchange. Is it tough when you've got a brain in your head and everybody thinks <laughs> you're just beautiful? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. It's annoying. <laughs> it makes you... Uh, oh exasperated. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a curse. <laughs> Growing up in Texas, that so-called curse was always there. In 1969, it was her ticket to Hollywood, when as a college beauty queen, Farrah was discovered in this photograph by a talent scout. At first, she was one more model and actress, surviving on guest parts and commercials, selling everything from shampoo to toothpaste. Mother always told me, sit up straight, eat all your vegetables, and stay out of small foreign cars. But Joey, mother never told me about Ultrabite. Uh, 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 you promised to teach me to play tennis. One of her first television appearances was on I Dream of Genie. Here we have a nice forehand, 
And here we have a nice backhand, then we have nice both hands. Like that. <laughs> On the courts, Tiger. In 1973, she married actor Lee Majors, then starring in The Six Million Dollar Man. Three years later, everything changed. It was 1976, she put on that red one-piece bathing suit, sold all those posters, and then she changed television forever. Good morning, Angels. Morning, Charlie. Charlie's Angels, the undercover, underclothed crime fighters, became an enormous hit and a cultural phenomenon. Charlie's Angels changed the way a lot of people looked at women. What we had for the first time were women operating in what was heretofore a man's world. Leonard Goldberg, along with his partner, producer Aaron Spelling, created Charlie's Angels. She wasn't a great actress then, but she was learning. She just had that way about her. When she would turn and look at you, you were mesmerized. The poster girl was now a TV star. She and her fellow angels, Jacqueline Smith and Kate Jackson, adorned nearly every magazine cover. If I could squeeze a gold watch out of Charlie, now would be the perfect time to retire. But after only one year, Farah walked away from it at the height of her fame. After Farah was a star, she left the show. Why? It was a shock. We were never able to pin it down because each time she came up with a reason, we solved the reason, but she still didn't want to come back. When Farah makes up her mind to do something, uh, it's well thought out, it's well ordered and planned, and it's right for her. Jacqueline Smith has known Farrah since their Charlie's Angels days. Today, Jacqueline is a successful businesswoman, selling her own line of clothing and furniture. It was not an actress leaving, it was my friend, and we were really a team. But what do you say? You know, stay back and keep us company when you want to go? So it is a mystery to you to this day exactly why Farrah, after one year, left Charlie's Angels. Yes, and the impact she had in that one year was amazing. When you talk to people, they go, well, Farrah did the whole show. And you go, no, she only did one year. People can't believe she only did one year. The press said Hollywood's success had gone to her head. In 1980, I asked her if it had. Was it a mistake? Would you do it all over again? Was it a mistake mm -hmm. leaving? No, it wasn't a mistake. And yes, I would do it over again. You would? Even yes. with all this mess and the fact that it almost torpedoed your career? I felt that I... I needed to grow. I find that for me personally, and this is in everyday life, if I'm not growing, if I can't be stimulated in a conversation, then I am bored. <laughs> and uh, I'm not good when I'm bored. You tried to make her stay. Oh, absolutely. We tried to make her stay. She wanted a movie career. Of course, she couldn't work for a long time because we had a contract and no one would hire her while she was under contract to us. Anger and lawsuits followed her departure. Her career faltered, but Farah was determined to take charge of her life. So she fired her manager and her publicist, and she separated from Lee Majors. The sweet blonde from Texas, she told me in 1980, was gone. I think that when you've, you're kind of just shoved out there, and you have to be tough, and you're facing tough people, and people are saying bad things about you, that all of a sudden you have to become a little less sweet. And with this surge and strength, you lose a little of the softness, I guess. Farah told me she was tired of being the sex symbol, and she wanted to be taken seriously. I came into a town one way. I became successful before I was ready for it or knew what I was doing, you know, um, kind of backwards, you know. The success came before I had done what I thought was a, a good role. What was the toughest part? Convincing people that you were serious, trying to get the parts, mm -hmm. what? Trying to get a good role. And she did, by doing an about face, literally. Her glamour gone, her acting amazing. As an unrecognizable abused wife who was driven to kill her husband in 1984's The Burning Bed. For years, it would remain one of the most highly rated TV movies in history. Score! 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 The performance earned her the first of three Emmy nominations. <laughs> I knew that if I was going to stay in the business, I had to change. I mean, I wanted to change. In the 1980s, Farah became the reigning queen of television movies. Forgive me for surviving! Maybe you 
To more critical acclaim, she also appeared on Broadway and in the movie version of Extremities as the avenging victim who turns on her rapist. But if her acting career was finally the triumph she always knew it could be, her personal life wasn't. <laughs> 